Now our next speaker is Mara Paternostro from Queen's University of Belfast. Hi, Tao. Hi, hello everyone. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay, hi Tao. So um, I guess I, hello everyone. I guess I can um, start sharing my screen. Yes, please. And uh, hopefully, uh, are you able to see it? Yeah? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great, cool. That's great, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Tao. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Gerardo. I hope you are all well. Um, the uh, for for the opportunity to talk. Okay, so this is um, going to be a, a relatively straightforward talk on some some aspects of Darwinisms of Darwinism that have um, hopefully not been been addressed by the previous by the previous speakers um, in this uh, in this first meet, the first morning of the of the workshop. Um, uh, needless to say, there will be there will be some redundancies in a sense because uh, people have been talking about Darwinism all morning. So in my plan of the talk, the, uh, the first part was a quick introduction to the emergence of objective reality in quantum Darwinism. And this will be incredibly, incredibly brief now, uh, owing to, to the fantastic work done by, by, the, by the, three, the three speakers before me. Um, I will just spend a couple of words on the notation that I will be using um, simply to set, to set the context. Um, instead, what I will, I will focus on will be um, um, say the mixture or the possible interplay uh, between, between two different features, say Darwinism on one end for the characterization of quantum to classical transition uh, and no Markovianity or Markovianity on the other one. Um, so we will we will see, um, uh, or at least we will have a discussion on um, the efficiency of the emergence of objective reality when uh, potentially uh, non-Markovian effect in the dynamics of the system of interest uh, become become important. The third part of the of the talk will will deal uh, with a different form of um, um, say characterization of of the process of emerge, of, of um, um, objective objectification, um, uh, and and this is this is basically a, a quantum control inspired um, say um, um, result uh, that will show how one can uh, mix again quantum Darwinism with another very well-known feature in quantum dynamics, which is the Zeno, the Zeno effect to control the rate of spreading of, uh, of information. Therefore, the, um, the, the rate at which um, uh, and the emergence of objective reality occurs. So in a sense, it will be uh, a talk where um, uh, very well-known names will 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 um, say uh, in uh, ever 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 game in making us more or less confused about about certain features of quantum Darwinism, and I should not and I cannot start without giving the due credit to who uh, contributed to uh, the various the various stand stands of the of the work that I will I will discuss. So first and foremost, uh, Nadia Milazzo um, was um, in, um, so yeah, master student in Palermo, and so yeah, finished recently a PhD in Tübingen. Um, Salvatore Lorenzo, a researcher at the University of Palermo in the group of Massimo Palma, who was the um, the leading the leading motor for this collaboration. And um, uh, what I will not be able to illustrate in this very unfit talk. Uh, will be will be uh, discussed is discussed in much more uh, um, appropriate terms uh, in in these three papers uh, that have been published in the last couple couple of years and and most recently um, um, say uh, a collaboration between between myself Steve Campbell and um, Owen Ryan a student in in, in Belfast resulted in some some additional additional exploration explorations of uh, the um, features um, linked to the emergence of objective reality when you have composite composite environments. Okay, so uh, you have seen already uh, these say this catch a few times. So I'm not going to annoy you with that again. You know what it means. You know what it is about. Uh, you know what uh, say the scopes of Darwinism is. Is um, say providing a characterization. Of the quantum to classical transition and emergence of the classical world from the from the uh, fundamentally quantum law at the microscopic at the microscopic lab. So I'm uh, not going to spend any more time on that. 
Um, what I will instead um, spend a little bit of time on is reinforcing the fact that information on a quantum system is only accessed indirectly by looking at um, um, something else. And this was uh, very well explained this morning by, by Michael and, and reinforced by, by uh, the, other, the, other, uh, the other guys speaking before me, before me uh, this morning. And this will be a very important component in my uh, in in the second and third part of my of my uh, of my talk, uh, because we are going to to um, um, address together at least two different configurations of these indirect looking at at a system through inverted commas an environment. The typical scenario is that of a system S surrounded by a bunch of environmental elements, as as you all know, and um, and monitored. Uh, to acquire information, and, and this configuration um, has been has been addressed fundamentally in in, in a series of very nice very nice work, uh, say dissecting the problem of of uh, the emergence of objective reality in uh, say from 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 a very deep from a very deep perspective, and and those outcomes are basically uh, summarized in the following two statements. So you have two sort of objectivities that emerge when you when you deal with this um, Darwinistic paradigm, in a sense. Uh, you have objectivity of observables, meaning that observers that access um, your system S uh, through a probing process that addresses only the environment C. Um, can only learn about um, the measurements that you perform on a prefer preferred observer, okay? And, and this is linked to the concept, the fundamental concept of point and basis. There is then objectivity of outcomes, meaning that observers that access the environment um, um, have almost full information about such preferred observable and agree on what they observe. And this is the, um, say, somehow the, uh, the spreading of information in a uniform manner across the elements of the elements of the um, of the environment the redundancy of encoding that is a very a very crucial pillar in the um, uh, in the formalization of the occurrence of, of quantum darkness and indeed uh, trying to formalize it um, one can state the following definition in that a state uh, of, a, of a system s um, exists objectively uh, if many observers can find out the state of S independently and without perturbing it. And this statement is fantastic because it encompasses all the, all the ingredients of quantum Darwinism. On one end, um, there is redundancy. So many observers are employed or entailed. And then there is this, um, uh, say, redundant encoding um, uh, without perturbation, which, which entails that if Psi S is the state of my initial of my is the initial state of my system before it interacts with the environment? Okay, and I've decomposed it in a in a, over a basis of states of my of my of my system where with with a probability amplitudes um, psi k. Then through the system environment interaction, I should end up in a structure. This is called a branching branching form uh, where there is a preservation of uh, so a survival of the information on the state of the system in that the probability amplitudes psi k survive the process of system environment interaction. And there is a redundancy element being there, so a, 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 an encoding, a redundant encoding in the form of local encoding of information in the various states of the environments that are, um, that are involved in the system environment interaction. Um, there has been a lot of work on trying to sharpen the definition of Darwinism um, from soft to, to strong uh, Darwin, quantum Darwinism, and, and then a related yet not equivalent manifestations like um, uh, spectral broadcast. But uh, what I uh, focus upon, because I'm a simple, simple minded person, I just look at a very simple picture is the definition of soft quantum Darwinism that states that um, if I look at the, at the environment that interacts with my system, there is a critical environmental uh, size, a fraction that I can look at, that I can, I can probe, and um, um, such that for any fraction that is larger than this critical value, the mutual information between system and such fraction is comprised between the uh, um, von Neumann entropy 
of the state of the system. So full information that I have on the state of the system on the right hand side. And on the left hand side, there is an arbitrarily set uh, deficit um, uh, determined by this quantity, the information deficit to information gap that I can pick up. Okay. Um, fantastic. So <clears throat> the picture that we have all in mind and that has been instigated, reinforced, and illustrated much better than what I can do uh, by, uh, by Michael, by Steve, by everyone this morning, is that of an interaction between uh, my system and fraction of environment that I'm, uh, are then uh, looked upon. And the uh, phenomenology of the emergence of quantum Darwinism, as entailed by this inequality stated by soft quantum Darwin, the definition of soft quantum Darwinism, is the appearance of this plateau of redundant information. And then the steep rise to, to a value that corresponds to, um, corresponds to uh, twice, uh, uh, say, the, the uh, so, sorry, to the, to, the, to the total information that, that I have on the state on the state of my of my of my system the um um let's say okay uh, having stated that um is it all clear do we have any problem and i think we have many problems in that not only in terms of the definition the sharpest definition of uh, the say, of Darwinism, and which, which which is fine and people much better than me have, have already uh perform fundamental work on that, but also on the way Darwinism plays with the uh, most important features in quantum dynamics. And one of them is the possibility of having back flow of information from the environments to the system. So if I take a typical uh, non-Markovian dynamics of my, of my system S, then I have to include the possibility that um, some of the information that from the system left uh, to populate, so to say, the fraction of the environment uh, that I'm, I'm looking at can be uh, returning to the system itself in light, for instance, of the finiteness of the environment, uh, uh, so a, a short recurrence time, um, or, or the features of the dynamics of the dynamics itself. So the emergence of, of non-Markovian effects uh, in open system dynamics um, I've been, and, and the interplay that they had in, um, or they have in, in the emergence of objective reality um, is a topic that has been long investigated. So I think that the best, say the first paper tackling it was this paper by, by Fernando Galve, Roberta Zambrini and, and, and Sabrina Maniscalco in 2016, where the conclusion was that um, the emerge, say the uh, um, occurrence of non-Markovian features hinders the emergence of objective reality. The reality is that the truth is, is that the statement should not and cannot be as strong. And um, the best that one can say is that what happens when you have no Markovian features affecting your dyna the dynamics of your system um, is not entirely clear in terms of its relations with, with quantum Darwinism. And the picture gets even, even more complicated when you abandon the paradigm of non-interacting environments and you plug in the possibility that the elements of your environment actually talk to each other and are connected as you would expect in a, in a realistic piece of matter, so to say, embodying the environment, for instance, of a solid state information carrier. So uh, the, picture, the, the, um, uh, um, the picture where you have, the, 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 the representation where you have independent environmental subsystems um, is good in many, in, many, uh, uh, in many conditions, but not in all of them. And, and what happens when you have um, um, connections among the environments and what happens in terms of the emergence of objective reality has been the topic of, of some investigations, including some work of myself with Nadia, uh, Massimo and Salvatore. And, 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 and the, the result of these is that uh, waters are mudded, mudded up. Uh, um, you, you don't necessarily see an in, hindering effect of quantum Darwinism. You might do that, you might have that, but the picture definitely needs a little bit more clarity. Am I going to provide such clarity? Definitely not. Uh, I want to point towards a situation or actually illustrate a situation where there is an even more thinking, I think, that we need to, to I believe, that we need to, to put in place. And before doing that, uh, just a small disclaimer, what I'm not going to talk about 
uh, is a um, strong part of quantum Darwinism on one end and spectral broadcasting structures on the other. I will add that to, to I will leave this to, to, to others to address. What I will focus upon is just the redundant encoding of information into the environment, which is already compromised in a way when addressing any of those two situations that I've illustrated, either uh, non-Markovian dynamics or uh, interconnections among the particle, among the, the elements of the environment. Okay, which is the situation that I'm going to illustrate. So uh, I, I've, I've been speaking about it without a clear cut illustration of what I'm going to, to, to study. So that's what I'm going to study. I'm going to, to present a system S and for, just for the sake of argument is a two level system, which will be coupled to a meter. And this meter is uh, for the sake of argument is an harmonic oscillator. And the reason why I'm taking an harmonic oscillator is that I'm, I'm um, quantum optician by training. So what I have in mind is um, um, a situation where, for instance, you have a two-level atom in a cavity. The cavity field is uh, the meter itself. And what you actually do in order to infer the state of the atom is to perform measurements on the field leaking out of the cavity. And given that the cavity is um, a leaky one, so it's an open cavity, uh, I'm going to assume that my meter, the cavity field, is surrounded and coupled uh, to a bunch of, of, of modes, actually a continuum of modes. Um, apologies here, there is a residual connection between the environment, this should not be there, okay? So the, at, this, at this level, I'm not going to consider interactions among, among the environment, the environmental subsystems, apologies for that. And my performance, say the performance of my measurements is through measuring the this uh, field leaking out affected by the, <coughs> sorry, about, by, by the coupling with these environmental modes. So I'm going to measure harmonic oscillators. Translating it into the form of an Hamiltonian, what I get is the following, right? So I have my system, I have my my uh, meter, Hamiltonian. Then I have the uh, free evolution of my, of my environment to, to a continuum of modes at different frequencies. And then I have the interaction between my system and the meter, which is basically a conditional displacement of the meter itself through uh, or based on the state of the spin state of the system. And then an interaction between my meter and the environment that is of an energy exchange form. So as I said, this is analogous to a quantum optics approach, and in particular, an approach that is uh, for which input-output theory is perfectly appropriate. And it has long been demonstrated that when you have input-output in place, then you can make use of the, of the favorite uh, uh, Steve's model, which is a collisional, a collisional approach. So basically, you can describe the seemingly complicated picture that I have presented here in terms of a system S, that interacts with my meter is coupled through this conditional displacement. And then I have a bunch of external modes that collide with my meter and that are measured through my measurement process, okay? Uh, the collisions are repeated. Every collision results in a small acquisition, a process of information acquisition from the environment that will eventually result in me getting the information on the state of the system through the meter itself, through what the meter has been able to write upon its density matrix about the, 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 the system itself. Okay, so far so good. Uh, a little bit of analysis, okay, a little bit of maths. I apologize for that. We need to, to understand the context. So I can move to an interaction picture with respect to the meter itself that leaves me, uh, um, sorry, uh, uh, it's, it's an interaction picture with respect to, to yeah, to the meter, to the, to the meter free, free dynamics in a sense, um, that leaves me a time dependent Hamiltonian um, where I have, oh, gamma here is the rate of coupling between, C, between meter and environment that results when I exponentiate this Hamiltonian, results in a time evolution operator that I can trotterize. I can use um, Suzuki trotter, a Suzuki trotter decomposition of this time evolution operator justified by the following assumption. In the collision-based model approach that Steve would put in place and that we did in, indeed take, uh, the collision time is very short, short enough that I can approximate my time independent, my time dependent Hamiltonian with a time independent one, uh, depending on each collision. Okay, collision by collision, I will have a short enough time of interaction that justifies the assumption of a time independent Hamiltonian. And this makes possible the resulting in the time evolution operator 
at step k in my repeated condition picture, where the system interacts with the meter, the meter interacts with the collisional, say the collisional modes, the, 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 the ancilla with which it's, it's, it's interacting through two very well established or very well understood mechanism. I have my conditional displacement operator, so resulting from the interaction between the spin, uh, my two level system and the meter. And I have also a beam splitter like interaction that spreads excitations from the meter into the environment. So if I start from an initial state where some information in, is encoded in the state of the system, but I have some fiducial states, some, some trustworthy states for both the meter and the environment, this repeated collision process after a certain number of collisions, which I call L, will result in a state that involves my system, the meter, and part, the L subsystems of the environment with which I have collided, with which my, uh, my, my meter has collided. And particularly, what I will have is that the state of the um, um, uh, uh, environmental particles, so the guys that are crashed on the meter, depend and will be correlated to the state of the spin system. The remaining um, N minus L modes with which uh, my uh, meter has not yet interacted will still be unaffected in a, in a, in a, factorized, in a factorized state. Fantastic. <clears throat> I'm interested only in the state of the system. That's where I want to characterize. So that's what I want to use in order to characterize, to characterize what is happening to it. So the first thing that I want to do is to trace out all the L um, environmental modes that I have um, uh, involved in my, in, my, in my collisional process and look at the reduced state of the, of the, of the meter, uh, sorry, of the system. Uh, so I also trace out the meter, right? And, and what I get is that the system undergoes a dynamics that is nothing else but a pure dephasing uh, uh, model uh, with a shrinking, a coherence shrinking factor, this K, um, that depends, of course, on the number of collisions that I have repeated. Basically, the state of the environment of the, of the system will be, uh, de will be defaced more and more uh, with the number of as the number of collisions grows. But the shrinking factor, particularly, this is particularly important, We'll have two contributions. This, this factor K that you see in my, in my the reduced density matrix, we'll have two contributions. We'll have a contribution that will depend um, explicitly on the fact that I have a meter. So it depends only, so to say, on the degrees of freedom of the, of the meter. And was rate, so the analysis is more um, uh, easily uh, presented. So apologies, I went to, uh, that's what you get when you have uh, uh, Animation, sorry. So the analysis is more easily presented in terms of rates of, 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 of shrinking rather than the shrinking factor itself. So that's why I'm taking the log uh, of, 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 of the two components, the one related to the meter and the one related to the environment after L collisions. And what I want to do is to characterize the dynamics, the reduced dynamics of this system. And what I have is that despite the fact that uh, characterizing non-Markovianity is as hairy and up in the air as characterizing Darwinism in the sense that we have various ways and various features that one can look at into in order to give a label of uh, Markovianity or non-Markovianity to a given dynamics. For the simple case of a purely defacing model, basically there is one universal way of doing of doing such a characterization. And this characterization basically agree on the fact that if I take the rates of this shrinking factor and this rate becomes negative at some time, then the dynamics is um, unquestionably no Markovi. So I'm basically working with the, the derivatives of these shrinking factor, of these rates of shrinking factors and testing what happens for various dynamical conditions. And if I take, for instance, a very soft meter, right? So very low frequency, and I plot uh, the rate of change of these two, uh, um, the rate of change of these two rates of shrinking factors, so d by the L of gamma M and d by the L of gamma R, so the meter related and environment related uh, rates, against the number of collisions that I perform and against theta. Theta here is basically a dimensionless interaction, interaction strength, okay? So it's the product between that factor gamma that I have in my Hamiltonian, 
giving you the real measure of strength between system and environment, between environment and meter, sorry, and, uh, and the interaction time, the collision time that I'm taking, taking uh, assuming in, my, in, the, in the simulation of the dynamics, what I see is that while gamma never gets, gets the rate of change of gamma never gets uh, negative, so here light green means positive, dark blue means, uh, means negative, uh, the rate of change of the uh, shrinking factor uh, due to the meter does change some and becomes negative, so negative to overcome the positivity of the other guy and giving me a negative, uh, uh, overall a negative, a negative rate, total rate, and therefore a negative, uh, um, a no Markovian dynamics. Uh, apologies. Oh, okay. So can you still see my screen? Tao, can I ask you to confirm, please? I, I had Skype bothering me. Yes. Um, we Thank you so much. Thank you, Tao. <clears throat> so now what I do is that I redo the same thing for, say, stiffer harmonic oscillator, so a stiffer meter, finding that this oscillation become a lot more violent and a lot more frequent, and, and, and the amplitude of them becomes a lot higher, so, and survive longer. So I have a, an even more pronounced non Markovianity regime. Fantastic. Uh, what is this, so how is this related to non Markovianity? Oh, sorry, uh, Darwinism or the emergence of redundant encoding. So I'm going to introduce a couple of quantities. On one end, I have the smallest fraction of the environment such that for an arbitrary deficit, an arbitrary gap delta, we have that the mutual information between my system and that fraction of the environment is larger than one minus delta, the uh, uh, entropy of the state of the system only. And then I define the, basically the number of environments providing redundant encoding. And this is this redundancy R. Okay, so from this fraction of the environment um, satisfying this inequality, I can define the number of environmental fractions, uh, environmental elements that provide a redundant encoding. And what I do in this plot is plotting, is simply showing what happens to the redundancy plateau against my, um, <coughs> sorry, my in, uh, dimensionless interaction strength theta, theta and, and, and the fraction, the smallest fraction of the environment. So in the case of a soft, um, of a soft meter, I have that a redundant encoding plateau emerged already at very small interaction strength, but for small interaction strength, I have some form of information trapping. So even if I go to a very large fraction of the environment, I never get my mutual information to shoot up to a full information. So some information remains trapped in the environment due to the softness of my harmonic oscillator or embodying the meter. If instead I have a very, a very stiff harmonic oscillator embodying the meter, I have that the plateau emerges only when I have a sufficiently, um, a sufficiently strong interaction strength. So for theta equal to pi, uh, in a sense, I have as strong as possible interaction strength, interaction between my meter and, 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 and the corresponding collisional elements. And in fact, I have a plateau and a full retrieval of information when I have a large enough, a large enough, a large enough fraction of the environment. How is this connected to non Markovianity? Um, I said there are various ways of characterizing it. Let's pick up one and just to be self referential, and I apologize for that. I'm picking the measure that Salvatore and myself have proposed a long time ago, and that is basically uh, funded upon, so funded upon um, the possible change in time of the volume of accessible states to your system. So if across an open dynamics, the system sees the number of states that are accessible th to it through the dynamics changing in time, then you might have an emergent in a non-monotonic manner, then you might have the emergence of non-Markovian effect. So if this volume shrinks and goes back to what it was right at the beginning, then I might have non-Markovianity. If the shrinking is monotonic, so my system tends towards a fixed point of the dynamics, the dynamics is instead fully Markovian. So I'm making use of this, of this quantity simply because it's simple to calculate for the case that I have. And what I have in this plot is a comparison between the measure of non-Markovianity that I, I, I have picked up, uh, plotted against the stiffness or the softness of my meter and the interaction strength, and the redundancy uh, plotted against the same values. And the results are somehow, somehow disappointing in the sense that 
um, uh, point, they, they, they give us um, more, no, no, an even more muddled picture in the sense that um, it seems on one end that uh, the emergence of uh, non-Markovianity um, is, say, uh, corresponds to an hindering of, of redundancy. Right, so I have pictures where a very, very, uh, say, a uh, high uh, redundancy with, uh, with, so basically, I need a big fraction of the environment in order to see a redundant encoding of information if my, if my measure of non-Markovianity is large. But I also have a, a section up here in the plot where I have a strong measure of non-Markovianity with a very low redundancy up. Up to uh, uh, say uh, up to the top of the right the right panel right right here where everything is black so showing that there are features also where th there are cases where through information trapping I I see a redundant encoding of information in the environment even where strong and strong Markovian effects are present. So the bottom line is that uh, we need a, probably a more fundamental approach to understanding what happens between non-Markovianity and, and Darwinism. I, I, I stated it, there is no good news coming from this, from this assessment. Tao, how long do I have? Um, you have like four minutes left. Five minutes. Ten, ten minutes, five minutes? What? Four minutes. Okay, that's fine. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, tackling the second part, so the last part actually of, 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 the, of the presentation, which uh, deals with controlling the spreading of information. So the picture is the one that you, um, that you would uh, more, more likely use in order to describe the emergence of Darwinism, where I get rid of my meter and I have a direct interaction between my system and environmental particles. Again, I use a collisional base model. So where the interaction between system and environment is through some collisions dictated by these Hamiltonian of interaction between the system and any of the elements of my environment. Qubits all the way, okay, so both my system, which is spin up, spin down, and uh, the environments, which are state A and state B, coupled at a strength omega. You calculate redundancy resulting from these dynamics and from some analytical um, expect, say, results uh, that will basically pass through the um, um, uh, derivation of an effective master equation for the dynamics of your system, you would expect that redundancy will grow with uh, uh, basically with this log k. Here, log k is basically uh, uh, log of the of the of the of the um, uh, of the strength of your of your of your interaction and the number of collisions. And if instead you and this is the blue line that you see here in this plot. If you resolve the dynamics exactly through the collisional base model as Steve, you get the jagged red line, which follows these, these dynamics perfectly. So the collisional base model is able to retrieve the expected behavior of my, of my redundancy. And okay, there is no surprise coming from the redundancy plot. That's okay, mutual information will come up as plateauing uh, for a sufficiently strong interaction between the system and the environment. Great. Now I do what Asher Perez would do in order, okay, so forget about, uh, forget about this, that, that doesn't matter. What I want to do is now to plug into my dynamics some element of Zeno. So what I do is that instead of having my environment in the form of a two-level system, I will have a V system, a three-level system, where the second branch of, of the uh, dynamics of my, of my environment is dictated by a very strong coupling between my level A and level C. And I will assume a, re a resonant interaction. So I will have the coupling between my spin system and two levels, level A and B of the environment, while I will have a very strong coupling between level C and level A. And this idea is perfectly with what Asher Perez in 1980 built as a model for the emergence of, that, of, 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 of Zeno. The strong coupling between level A and level C results in freezing of the dynamics of the environment that is very quickly and very strongly projected onto state A and stays there, depleting the capability of my environment to encode redundantly information about the system. In fact, if I have a sufficiently large coupling strength between level A and level C, 
what I get is basically the nullification of the redundancy due to the emergence of a zero effect. And you can reverse it. Uh, okay, so the plot, the, the redundancy plot is not particularly important. So you are slowing down the process of encoding of information from the system to the environment. And it's a process that you can even reverse. So in fact, in, 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 in this paper with, with uh, Salvatore and with Massimo, we show that you can even engineer an anti-Zeno process where you can briefly or very, 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 uh, very lightly increase the rate at which information is spread from the system to the environment uh, by playing with the configuration of the environment itself. Okay, with that, I'm done. These are the guys in Belfast. These are the guys that put the bread on our table. I thank you for your time and your attention and I think I should be on time. So thank you so much. You are right on time. Thank you for your talk, Mauro. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so um, we have time for questions. Does anyone have questions for Mauro? Okay, so let me ask a question then. Um, yeah, so I'm also interested in like the kind of really complicated relationship between Ramakovianity and quantum Darwinism. Like, do you have a better idea <laughs> of what's like the, most, the more fundamental thing? No, not at all, uh, Tao. Not at all. Uh, I think it's a very it's it's a very airy business, and and the more we look into, so Steve can. Steve can, can, can speak at length. So the more we look about it, we are working together on it. The more we look into it, the, le the less I understand about the relations between Nomakovianity and, 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 and Taoism. It seems to be a very uh, uh, system dependent, system dependent mm -hmm. relation, but I don't believe a lot into say system dependent relations. I believe that when we are facing a system dependent relation, there is just something more fundamental that we are missing, and that I'm, I'm, I'm not I've not been able as of, as yet to 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 dig out. So uh, you, I think you are, you are great. I mean, it's a great idea to look into this topic. Um, we probably have, as, as as say scholars interested in this in this relation, we probably have to change approach because simply looking at uh, causal links between. Um, re say redundant encoding of information and the, the backflow of information is probably not enough to dig out what is what is the link which is which is the link between these two phenomena. So I, I apologize. I'm sorry. I'm not bringing good news in this in this sense. That's totally fine. Thank you for answering. <coughs> um, Michael Zola. Yeah. Hi, Michael. Hi. So just a, you know, a quick comment. I mean, I'm glad you ended on not good news. I mean, you, you know, I, I didn't say this, I should have in my talk, you know, photons basically scatter all things and they don't interact, right? You know, including not with each other and even with air, it's very weak, oh. right? I mean, right. And, and actually the NV center case is also a case of this. So, I mean, I, I think it's 100% important to investigate like non-Marcovian effects and interactions in the environment. We have a paper about rise and fall of redundancy with interactions in the environment too. But those kind of scenarios that you expect to give rise to objectivity, you know, there's very weak interactions, right? So you do expect a regime, right? Um, that, that's that, 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 that's fine. Uh, that's fine. Uh, but not necessarily you have to think about photonic Photonic systems, I can I can look into phononic modes and and oh. um, right, right. So <coughs> there are various there are various situations where where a picture where you have um, a, say a probe and then an environment interacting with the probe would do would do fine. Or let me also take another another picture, right? So that might be the effective description of an otherwise system say standard system environment interaction where you have a say a colored noise. Yeah, so um, uh, Asan Nazir and his group are the masters of um, uh, the, mapping, the mapping of system environment interaction with arbitrary spectral densities into this reaction coordinate picture where you have a system, a, 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 a guy in the middle that is then coupled to something else, okay? And, and, and that, that might be a picture that one can, can use and address in this case. That, that's right. I, I, I mean, I, th I think my comment here is just that we don't expect, you know, quantum Darwinism and objectivity to arise in all situations. Sure. And then, you know, another quick thing, 
Um, you know, a lot of the models we saw, you know, the pure decoherence, for instance, is a, it's a pretty simple model. You can complicate it a bit, but you know, that, that, that also has actually some non-Markovian effects. <laughs> you know, there is two way. Now it's different from what you were studying. So I don't, but, but, you know, maybe looking into sort of that connection, there is, you know, there's backflow of information. Definitely. Right? I, definitely. We have looked also at other models. So not, not necessarily say, uh, this model is cute because it, it comes up as a, as a as a as a as a pure defacing model, so it's simple to understand and analyze from the viewpoint of Nomakovianti. But we have seen also, say, uh, um, other results, say, other more complicated, effective than open system dynamics, and and the picture is even more complex in that case. All right, <laughs> thank and you, that's all. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for the great talk. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're gonna actually go to the lunch break now. I know that Yarek has another question from Mara, so. If you hey, want to, yeah, uh, yeah, just a, just a quick question, Mauro. Do you I, consider I, I, hi, hi, hi. Do we consider the possibility that simply there is no connection between objectivity oh, and uh, and um, uh, Markovianity? We studied um, uh, spin boson model uh, from the perspective of of SBS, where the transition from uh, Markovianity to non-Markovianity is very clear. It's in the this ohmic power or in the power law and you go from one power law to the other anyway this has been studied for four decades and people understand it very well we added to it uh, objectivity analysis in the form of uh, this uh, stronger form so sbs and there seemed to be absolutely no connection absolutely perhaps, perhaps however however appealing that might be that there is a connection between the information going there yeah. and back and rise or not of objectivity in this form and the other yeah, absolutely but maybe right. maybe the nature says no guys no connection you're absolutely right i mean uh, the optimist the optimist in me uh no I'm, so if i wake up in a good mood i i i, I that, that my, my take is yeah it's just that i don't understand it the, the pessimist in be. me uh, would would go along the very same direction as you uh, as the one that you have you have just pictured. So there is no connection, and we are simply trying to twist the wrist of of, of, of nature by by artificially artificially looking for something that is is indeed not necessarily not necessarily. So I, I fully agree with you. But before giving up, I would like to have a very good argument that tells me, okay, you know what? Give up. <laughs> sure, sure. Great, Thank you, Yari. Thank you. Thank it's you. good to see you again. Thank you for the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Sure. So um, we have a breakout room open as well. So if anyone wants to join and continue chatting, that's up to you. Or otherwise, we have a, about an hour's break before we come back.